Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction House, and I'm taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming June of 2016 regional auction. And today we're going to take a look at a couple of different Ortgis pistols. These are a German self-loading straight blowback 32, also 25 and 380 caliber, not quite concealed pistol, but basic small defensive pistol. Now, a lot of people would regard the Ortgis as a pretty boring pistol. And in reality, there are a couple of interesting mechanical details, but to me, really, it's the story behind the manufacturer and the guy who did the work and the, the production that is the interesting thing about the Ortgis. Now, this company was put together by a guy named Heinrich Ortgis. Uh, he was born in 1870 in Germany, in Lower Saxony specifically. And he basically worked as a salesman. Uh, he was traveling around quite a bit. He worked in the, well, the Near East, I suppose you would call it, uh, Russia, Azerbaijan. Um, he was actually a diplomatic vice consul for Turkey in Liege in 1914, which seems like a kind of odd post. But clearly the guy got around, he had some connections. And after World War I, right at the end, he got in contact with a guy named Carl August Browning, who was a gun designer. In fact, he would go on to work for Walther. We took a look at a very odd sheet metal Walther prototype rifle designed by Carl August Browning not long ago. Well, the same guy had a patent, had some, some pistol patents, and Heinrich Ortgies bought license to use those patents. And he set up a company, and in 1919 he started making pistols. Now, he didn't make a whole lot. Uh, he only manufactured guns from 1919 until 1921, early 1921. And he only made about 16,000 in total. However, as a businessman, this probably turned out to be a fantastically profitable venture for him, or at least a very successful one. Because what happened in 1921 is his whole company and patents and production uh, equipment, everything, was bought out by Deutsche Werke. Now, this was a a, basically a government-sponsored, sort of quasi-government-run industrial organization, and they were looking for things that they could manufacture, uh, profitable projects. And they found Heinrich Ortgies pistol manufacturing facility, and, or uh, manufacturing plans, and they liked the idea, they bought him out, and they set up serious production of these guns. Uh, by the time they were done, just a couple of years later, almost 400,000 of these pistols had been produced. So Heinrich himself, He's out of the project in 1921, presumably with a nice pocket full of cash for his trouble. A couple years, he sets it up, gets it going, sells it off, done. Very successful as a businessman. I presume, I don't actually know how much money he got uh, for the sale or, or what his financial circumstances were. At any rate, uh, Deutsche Werke goes on to start, they're, they're producing these guns in very large quantity. Uh, they're the ones who actually add the 380 and the 25 caliber options. We have a 25 here. The 32 and the 380 are the exact same uh, frame. Now, the Inter-Allied Military Control Commission was this group that was set up to monitor German arms production. Uh, they wanted to make sure that Germany wasn't cheating, and they really didn't like Deutsche Werke making such a huge quantity of pistols. Uh, by the way, in total, this would come to 250,000 of the 32s uh, and 380s and 183,000 of the 25 caliber guns. Well, the Control Commission didn't like this. They, they were really trying to shut this down from the very beginning. Uh, ultimately, they ordered the company sh to shut down production on April 1st, 1922. Um, but uh, this was evaded. I, I don't know the details. But ultimately, uh, production continued until September of 1923, uh, when it was, in fact, shut down. So that was, you know, the production span of these guns was pretty short. It was 1919 at the very beginning, just until 1923 and over 400,000 of them were manufactured. So uh, in total, 250,000 of the large frame guns, the 32s and the 380s, and 183,000 of the small frame 25s were produced. So these went everywhere. Um, they were actually fairly popular with German police and security forces, uh, as well as being used for export, and sold on the, the civilian commercial market. Now, that's one of the interesting things, where these, these guns come back around again uh, and tie into American history. There's a lot of these pistols in the United States. And the reason for that is because so many of them were made in the 1920s, and a lot of them did stay in Germany. Now, some came over here uh, with straight export purchases at the time, but a lot of them were still in Germany at the end of World War II. 
they were a, an available, easy, and, and commonplace pistol uh, at the end of the war when people just needed something, any kind of armament would do to send out to the Volkssturm. So because so many of these pistols were still around in Germany after World War II, they became really common souvenirs for American troops uh, during the, the occupation of Germany. You know, they're, they're cheap, they're kind of ubiquitous, and especially for the occupation troops who weren't, they weren't actually in frontline combat capturing stuff, and maybe they weren't privy or didn't have access to military stockpiles when all the guns were formally surrendered. Well, you know what, there's a lot of these floating around in the, the in, com in commercial civilian hands, and they're easy to get a hold of. So a lot of these came back as trophies after World War II, which is a large part of why we have so many of them today. So with all of that in mind, why don't we go ahead and take a, a look at the mechanics, because there are some very interesting features to them, unusual things that we don't see elsewhere, some good and some bad. So here are three examples. A uh, couple things we'll go over. This is a special, uh, special order button safety type, which we'll look at in a moment. This is a very typical large frame, uh, in this case a 32 caliber or geese. And then this is a very stereotypical small frame, 25 caliber pistol. Now mechanically all three are the same, with the exception of the safety, which like I said we'll get to. Uh, so I'm going to leave this one alone. Uh, we'll take a look at this one primarily to can show you all the mechanical elements in that. Now a couple things before we get into them. You're going to find serial numbers on the bottom of the frame. That's fairly standard, that's where you'll always find them. Uh, if you find one marked Germany, that indicates that it was manufactured allegedly for export. Now the large frame guns are all in a single serial number range regardless of caliber. The small frame guns are on their own independent serial number range. All right, we have a variety of different types of markings or different marking styles on these guns. Sometimes you'll see this or a patent on the, the right side. Sometimes you won't. You will, however, find the caliber marked on the barrel. That's an important thing to note because mechanically, other than the barrel, the 32 and the 380 guns are identical. You can literally take the barrel out of one and swap it into the other. So this is our 32 example. Here's our 380 example. 380, of course, is 9mm Browning short. They are, in fact, similar enough that on the magazines you will find 765mm on the one side of the magazine, 9mm on the other. So the magazines are interchangeable as well. There are a couple different styles of marking on the left side as well. This is a, a, a typical one, but like I said, you will see differences. These were manufactured both at Erfurt and at Berlin, depending on date. Uh, the company up moved its operations during production, so you'll see both. You will also see uh, three different styles of grip medallion. This is the later one. It's a stylized cat, basically, in the shape of a D, presumably for Deutsche Werke. Here are the markings on the 380. Uh, you can see this is a Berlin production gun, and it's still Ortgis patent, Deutsche Werke, etc., but uh, different script, different marking style. And this has the earlier style of grip medallion, that's an H and an O for Heinrich Ortgis. Now there are only a couple controls on here. We have a heel magazine release, which works just like you would expect. We have the trigger, and then we have a safety. The safety consists of a grip safety and a release button. So the gun won't fire unless the grip safety is squeezed. However, interestingly, once you do squeeze the grip safety, it latches in place, and it remains squeezed and thus fireable until you press the safety release button, which opens it back up. So this functions more as a sort of manual safety like we would expect to use with the thumb than it does with a, as a grip safety. Um, it's not a grip safety that requires you to maintain a solid grip on the gun. It's really a manual safety that happens to be operated by the web of your hand when you first grip the pistol. So an interesting idea. Um, I think a lot of people would kind of misunderstand the purpose of that safety simply because we're so used to spring-loaded grip safeties that automatically re-engage whenever you don't have a grip on the gun. Now to disassemble this, we're actually going to use this release button and we pull the slide. Because this is a simple blowback pistol, the barrel's fixed into the frame, what we want to do to disassemble is pull the slide back. Unlike many blowback pistols, we don't pull it all the way back. It only goes yeah, about a centimeter or so. We depress this button, and there it is. You can see here that this button 
in addition to operating the grip safety, it has a part of like a frame rail that prevents the slide from coming off. So by depressing that, we allow the slide to come up and off. And then we can take it forward, remove the slide. Our recoil spring is located concentric around the barrel, and then we've got the frame down here. Inside the slide, we have a striker and spring. That's pretty typical. The firing pin is a bit long because it does double as the ejector. So when the slide opens all the way, the firing pin protrudes through the face of the bolt and kicks the empty case out. And we just have a striker spring and its little guide rod. Uh, something to point out, the grip safety, which is right here, is, in, is um, operated by the striker spring. So if you have the gun disassembled, the grip safety no longer has any spring tension on it. That pretty much covers it for the slide. There's nothing else really going on in here. There's an extractor right there, some serrations. That's pretty much it. Now, a couple interesting features on the frame. First up, the barrel is fixed to the frame by a square dovetail, which we rotate 90 degrees to the left counterclockwise, and it comes off. This is very much like the Japanese Hamada pistol. Uh, it is possible that Hamada had seen the Orkis. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the reverse is not likely. This came first. Now the sear and the disconnector on this are a bit interesting and unusual. When you pull the trigger, it simply pivots this whole assembly, this part, pivots on this pin, which causes the back end to drop. And this tab right here is what's holding the striker back. So when you pull that down, releases the striker and fires. Now most of the time, a disconnector will be in here operating vertically. On the Orgies, the disconnector is actually this little button. So when I pull the trigger and then push that button, it allows, it's hard to see, but this drops back down. Let's zoom in so you can see that a little better. I pull the trigger, when I push that button, this drops back down. Now the way this works, you can see it just barely extends out to the side of the slide there. And there's a little cutout in the slide so that when the gun is in battery, this is allowed to protrude outside of the, the frame like that. When you fire, the slide pushes back here, that uh, groove ends, and the slide pushes this button in. So it works quite well. Uh, it is one of the kind of a little fiddly springy part in there. Uh, the only other potential issue with it is that if you do a lot of shooting, if you have a lot of wear on the gun, this, it's not that difficult for this to wear to the point that it may not function properly, which could be a safety issue. This does also act as your out of battery safety so that if the slide's not fully closed, it won't allow it to fire. Uh, you do want to make sure that that's in good working order if you're going to be doing much shooting with one of these. Lastly, here at the back, you can see how the grip safety spring works. It's, like I said, the striker spring, which is going to rest on this tab. And as long as I have the release pushed, I can push the grip safety back. So you can see they're connected there. That allows the striker spring to operate the grip safety. Now the last trick here is the grip panel removal. You'll notice there are no screws, kind of like a broom handle Mauser. Uh, Ort Geese had this clever idea that turns out to be really kind of more of a pain than it is clever. Uh, the idea is there's actually a little spring-loaded catch right about here inside underneath the grip panels that holds them in place. And once you depress that catch, they just lift out nice and easily. And I think the idea is you're supposed to use a finger in there to depress the catch. Well, mine doesn't fit. I, I can't do that. Um, maybe, maybe after you'd gone through the turnip winter in Germany, that was less of an issue. But for us fat-fingered Americans, we're going to have to use a tool like a screwdriver to go inside and depress that spring. Okay, I had to go off camera because it was being really fiddly with the screwdriver, but this is our spring-loaded piece. That holds the grips in place. When I push this all the way down, that one falls out nicely. What we have here are these two little metal tabs on this spring-loaded catch, and they slot into a little recess cut inside the grip dovetail right there. It's so small it's kind of hard to see on camera. If we look at this from the side, you can see that this side is flat, this side is angled. So what you're supposed to do is slip the grip in that way and then flap it, flatten it down. And while holding that catch, 
you then release the catch and allow those tabs to come in under the grips and hold the grips in place. This is very clever and a real pain in the butt. Uh, now, people who get uh, frustrated and run out of patience trying to get these off, if you just put a screwdriver underneath and try and pry the grip off, what you will inevitably do is snap out, break this little thin uh, slat of wood, and then you have no way to hold your grips in place. They just, they're, they're done forever. So, good idea, maybe not so much on the practical side. So we saw how the grip safety works. It's engaged and safe here. Now it's disengaged, ready to fire until you push the button. Well, you had an option, if you wanted it, uh, you could order a, an extra safety button as well. The idea there was for primarily like law enforcement groups that required some sort of thumb-operated manual safety. So what this does is allow you to push the safety up like this. That prevents you from disengaging the safety as long as this thumb safety is in the upward position. It even has a little S for safe there to let you know that it's engaged. Now when you're ready to shoot, you push the button down, now it says F for fire, then you can squeeze the grip safety, which is really like a manual safety, and now you're ready to shoot. Uh, the other interesting thing to point out here is apparently the, the functioning of this inside the frame in, uh, got in the way of this fancy grip retention uh, tab spring-loaded thing. So on the guns with this safety button, there actually is a grip screw. There's a hole drilled in the frame and one screw that goes through and secures both of the grip panels. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something about these typically considered kind of bland and ordinary pistols. There's really a lot more depth to them. So if you'd like to own any of these three, they are all, of course, coming up for sale here at Rock Island. If you take a look at the description text below, you'll find links to all three catalog pages. You can check out the guns that they are bundled with for this regional auction, and if you'd really like to have any, you can place bids right there through Rock Island's website. Thanks for watching.